Can Charles and Janice's marriage be salvaged? The pre-interview has certainly been revealing, but the crucial 15-minute videotaping is still to come. Dr. Carrere is about to put a lifetime of personal experience and the latest technology to work on the trail of love. Hey, buddy. Where did love come from anyway? And how did it become so powerful? Well, it all started 300 million years ago when our scaly forefathers ventured forth. Unlike us, they had only reptilian brains because they were, well, reptiles. Brains looked like this. Brainstem, medulla, pons, and cerebellum. Good for keeping the old heart and lungs going, tracking down dinner and having sex, or what passed for it. Psychiatrist Dr. Thomas Lewis. Reptiles don't have emotions and they don't have love or affection or bonds or families or nurturance or any of those things because they don't need them. The reptiles give birth to eggs and eggs don't need any Then about 200 million years ago, the first mammals came along. They still had components of the reptilian brain, but there were new developments in the thalamus, hippocampus, hypothalamus, cingulata ungata, septum, and amygdala. Taken all together, this is what scientists refer to as the limbic system, the old mammalian brain. And what was all this hardware for? Well, for one thing, it became the system by which mammals and eventually humans would be able to emotionally code or tag experiences. The emotions evolved to help us survive. There's deep connections between areas of the brain for memory and decision making and for feeling. The emotions tend to color our experiences in ways that enable us to remember what we should and should not do in life. Mother Nature soon took things a step further. When mammals came along, they have a fundamentally different method of reproduction in that they give birth to live, helpless young. And those young require a lot of advanced caretaking. A mammalian parent has to be able to look at an infant or a baby and know what it needs in order to provide it or else the infants are all gonna die. Here's how it works. When a mother nurses her infant, emotional triggers in the limbic brain release the hormone oxytocin into the blood. The mother experiences a feeling of contentment and attachment. These sensations are associated at the emotional level, and as a result, the nursing experience is coded as a pleasurable one. This helps ensure that the baby will not go hungry, and well-fed babies give you a leg up in the battle for genetic survival. And it really is clear that the limbic brain is responsible for giving you that experience that, say, your wife is something different than an armchair. In time, the human brain evolved, and it claimed aspects of both the reptilian and old mammalian brains. But the thing that set it apart was the size and development of the neocortex, or rational brain. And this brain gave human beings the ability to reason, to choose what was best for them. Our mammalian forefathers may have invented the Book of Love, but that doesn't mean we are particularly good at reading it. And when it comes to staying in love, some of us are almost illiterate. Psychologist and therapist Pat Love. I think the real reason why many of us are having difficulty is we've come into adulthood and we really haven't seen a healthy love relationship with a model that works for today. So if we can't always count on our parents to teach us about love when we're children, can we take love lessons as adults? Today's young lovers are warned to pay attention because there will be a test. In some cases, church clergy are refusing to marry couples who have not taken up to four months of marriage life skills instruction. Certain states even require that couples pass premarital exams in order to get a license. And who wants to flunk a love test? But not to worry. Psychologist Pepper Schwartz has developed a handbook for the romantically challenged, a sort of primer for the prenup. 
Well, what it is, is it's a compendium of tests that either clinicians or researchers have used to help their clients. And what we did was just try and make them into English so you didn't have to be a, a clinical to use them. Here's what one of these tests look like. This one is on philosophy. Scientists have discovered that the more similar a couple's philosophy, the more mileage they are likely to get out of their relationship. There are no right or wrong answers to a test like this. Ideally, you and your spouse simply need to hold the same views. But the test is not infallible. Okay, the question is, I consider who a per person will become before I commit myself to them. No, because I can't prejudice them. Same answer, no. Um, I don't think you can, you, you can look at the future. You can, you can hope, you can pray, but you've got to jump off the diving board. Yeah. I think I did consider what you might become when I committed myself to you. For me, I think uh, yes and no. I just knew that the future was something I wanted to be in. Well, I analyzed her very carefully. I was sure I wanted to marry her. I was not too flattered about this. <laughs> well, I don't know why people wouldn't be. <laughs> if I did consider it, it was never at a conscious level. I was much too young to be thinking of what people would become and having all those existential type um, thoughts. And you have to remember then, it was in the heat of battle, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so, So you married out there? I'm a married guy. Married uh, 11 years, which is exactly what she would have got for killing me. Comedian John Wing has learned to mind the mishaps of his own marriage for humor. 11 years is a long time. One of his most popular pieces of shtick Regular. is a lamentable take on communication. I'm a good husband, though. It's difficult. You don't have to know very much to be a good husband. Any, what do you have to know? Four words. Oh, yeah, right, sorry. Pretty simple, use them individually or in a cluster. I think when a lot of men heard me do it and the next time their wife asked them to do something and they used it and it became a little, it became a private joke for a lot of couples, a lot. Honey, I thought you were gonna mow the lawn. Oh. Yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry. As far as behavioral science is concerned, John's screwball marital advice is not that far off the mark. It's just a little twisted. If you look at power in a relationship, the guys who are willing to accept influence you know, who are willing to say, oh, yeah, you know, I never thought, I mean, that's a good idea. Those guys are way ahead of the game. <clears throat> the guys just say, no, you're not going to control me, you know. I'm not going to do that. And they say no all the time. They reject influence. They wind up divorced. What else do you need to know to be a good husband? Three things you could know. Listen, that's a big one. Take direction well. Try not to think for yourself. A 20-year-old girl came up to me the other night and said, you should talk to my boyfriend. You could teach him a lot of things. But well, I find it fun that women uh, get all, uh, how does he know this stuff? I think that's really cool. Most of the time, there aren't that big differences between men and women. In fact, in marriages that are going well, there's almost no gender differences. But when marriages are ailing, there are a lot of gender differences. Guys are much more likely, for example, to withdraw for marital conflict. Women are more likely to lean forward and engage and, and be relentless in trying to solve the problem. Even more important than actually listening is the appearance that you are. Therefore, you must adopt a listening posture, <laughs> if I may. We know from experience that 80% of the time, it's the woman in our culture who brings up the issues. He says, you know, this is a problem and has suggestions for how to solve it. And usually the guy really hasn't thought about it, hasn't noticed it. Women don't tell us their problems so that we solve them. No, they tell their problems so that in telling us, the words come out of their mouth, float over to us, bounce off our hollow skulls, <laughs> echolocate back into her ear. She hears what she's saying and figures out how to solve it for herself. <laughs> 
something. So she comes into the room, you're watching TV, she comes in and says, I have a problem. A problem. So much for the new age sensitive guys.